What is the greatest office there is on earth? You stop and think about it. Somebody says, well, it's the Heisman. Somebody says it's the Super Bowl trophy. Uh, somebody says it's to be valedictorian of, of, uh, uh, of my high school class. Gorman, you remind me of a fellow that I went to school with. He was from up in Michigan, and he said, and he said there were 298 students in my class, and I was second. I was so impressed until he said second from the bottom. And uh, <laughs> you, you and I need to have an appreciation that there. What about being president of the United States? Is there any office any higher than that? Well, let me introduce this, uh, this part of the lesson by talking about our 20th president, James A. Garfield. James A. Garfield was president, and he was a New Testament Christian. The first Sunday in Washington after his inauguration, a member of the cabinet insisted that the cabinet meeting be called at 10 a.m. the following day, Sunday, to handle a matter that threatened a national crisis. Garfield refused on the grounds of another appointment. The cabinet member insisted that the national matter was of such grave importance the president should break that engagement. Garfield refused. The cabinet member remarked, I should be interested to know with whom you could have an engagement so important that it could not be broken. Garfield replied, I will be as frank as you are. My engagement is with the Lord to meet Him at His house and at His table at 10.30 a.m. tomorrow, and I shall be there. That's remarkable. In a day and age in which there's so much unbelief in, uh, in, in Washington, to know that uh, just, you know, we had a president who was of that very nature. You and I need to have an appreciation not only for that, but you need to have an appreciation of the other aspect that James A. Garfield said. James A. Garfield was the only gospel preacher who served as the President of the United States. He was elected by a close election with only a plurality of 7,368 of the popular vote. Unfortunately, he was assassinated while in office after serving about 200 days. His final words were, I believe in God and trust in His hands. He was a general of the Northern Army in the Civil War. But during the war, he preached in Southern Congregation in Mooresville, Alabama, and in also in South Carolina. I grew up very near Mooresville, Alabama, some 15 miles away, and at that church when the Civil War was going on, here is this Yankee army, and I mean that respectfully, as a Southerner would say it, and here's this Yankee army that is, that, is, that is devastating, and his army was in camp near Mooresville on a Sunday morning. That northern general came to the southern congregation and preached. Christ is greater than war, it's greater than civil conflict. He did the same thing when he was in the Carolinas. He was, in many respects, a remarkable, after the Civil War, he resigned from being an elder in the Lord's Church to become President of the United States. He said he was stepping down from the highest office to accept the office of the President. You and I need to have an understanding of just how amazingly wonderful it is that in the wisdom of God there are elders in the church. We need to have an understanding of what elders are. Our history in America gives us a concept of it of the American Indians where there were those individuals who sat uh, around a campfire, as it were, the older men in that tribe, and looked after the tribe. 
they were to move to another place. If, they, if, they were, if there was some problem that needed to be resolved, those chiefs and those leading men would sit around that campfire and talk about what's happening. That concept is a part of our heritage, though it's not as widely known as it once was, but it's not at all that different from having elders in the church. In Judaism, there were the elders of the city. You may recall that whenever that son was gluttonous and rebellious, that it was to be brought before the elders of the city. So within Judaism, God had an arrangement for responsibility for those who were overseers in some respect to all of the things that happened in Judaism. Ezekiel chapter 34 is, is an interesting chapter. We do not have time to look at all of it. Well, there were some individuals who had become elders of the city because they thought there was notoriety and advantage to be gained by them in being elders in the city. And so in this chapter, the prophet of God says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of, the, of Israel. Prophesy and say, thus says the Lord, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should they not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourself with the wool, you, but you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you... You heal those who were sick, nor bound the broken, nor brought back that which was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty. So my people were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became a food for the wild beast of the field. In this very passage, God looked at those individuals who had the responsibility of caring for Israel and rebuked them. Because their place in being shepherds of, the, uh, shepherds of Israel was a place of honor that they had coveted for themselves. And they had accepted the honor of being that shepherd, but they had not done the work. We need to understand that when the Lord set up the church in the first century, those shepherds in Israel were at the background of the very idea of having shepherds, elders in the church. And there are many lessons to be learned from that. Well, when he established the church, unlike modern Christendom that has a hierarchy that sometimes can be insensitive to everything that goes on within, within the church, the Lord set up in a very, very simple way. In every church that was a full and mature church, there were those individuals who were given specific qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1 about the spiritual nature of these men. And so God appointed them not to be lords over the church, as sometimes is the case in reference to church hierarchy, but to be those who serve the church in this way and that is to watch out for the spiritual welfare of every sheep, every lamb in the kingdom of God. But it may be that you've not grown up in the church. It may be that you're visitors and you're not aware of everything that was involved in being an elder in the church. What was an elder? What is an elder in the church? Well, there are six words English words used to describe these individuals who are elders in the church. There are six of, six of these words. The first one is elders and presbyters. You may see within that word, the second word, it's a Greek word, the, the concept and the, uh, the origin of the name Presbyterian. For when the Presbyterian group was pulling away from the Church of England, unlike having the church hierarchy, at least in the beginning, they pulled away, and within the local congregation, they were ruled by presbyters. Unfortunately, even within that new religion, as it began, a church hierarchy developed above the local congregation. 
But the Bible talks about elders and presbyters. Secondly, it talks about bishops and overseers. We'll define these terms in just a minute. Some of them we'll readily recognize, bishops and overseers. And the third one is shepherds and pastors. All six of these words are used to describe those who are elders in the church. And so we could just as easily talk about shepherds in the church or pastors in the church. A preacher's not a pastor. He's an evangelist. He's a minister of God. He's a servant of God like all Christians are, but he's not a pastor. Pastors in the church are those men meeting specific qualification who oversee the things that happen in the church. Now I said that there are six English words used to describe elders in the church. It's rather remarkable that the word presbyter is only found in the King James Bible. It's rare indeed. In fact, I do not know of another translation that uses the word presbyter there because that is just the Greek word presbyteros, and that's the word that is, transla- that, that, that is translated elders, and it is translated uh, uh, presbyters. And it emphasizes the spiritual maturity of these men. God's setting up something new in the church. And so in the church, He's going to have officers, if that's the right word in the church, who are going to have a responsibility, and they need to be spiritually mature men. There's a second Greek word, episkopos. You may see the word episcopalian in this. Episkopos is the word that is translated bishops and overseers. You and I need to understand that the Bible forbids elders from being lords. And sometimes in denominational hierarchy, you'll have a bishop that sits almost uh, in a role where he's over the state, or perhaps even as an archbishop over a region of, 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 our, of our land, perhaps even over nations worldwide. But in the New Testament time, they were just simply those individuals who had to make the decisions. But listen to this, not the kind of decision about what's right and what's wrong, not kinds of decision about how how, uh, God is to be worshiped. All of that is specified by God. There is that book, and that book regulates all of our lives, and we need to have an appreciation of that. In fact, the Bible says they are not to be lords over God's heritage. They're to be examples to the flock. So here are those who in in, in a political world and in in, uh, uh, in ancient English history, there were those lords. That's not what the Bible has in mind. It has in mind those who are overseers, but they serve the church as overseers. I want you to hear that. They serve as overseers. And so in that sense, those bishops, elders, overseers, presbyters are servants of the church and far removed from that concept. And then there is that third word from which we get the word shepherds and pastors. It's poimen. And it has to do with the work that is involved that an elder does. An elder's work is not to make decision as his primary work in the church. He's a shepherd. He is the one described in Ezekiel 34 that when there are sheep that are astray, he goes out. He takes care of the lambs, those uh, small uh, uh, individuals in the flock, those new converts in the kingdom of God. And his responsibility is to feed and to make sure that those individuals are fed. Now, there are some special qualifications for a man to be an elder. We note some of them right now. Number one is all all elders are to be the same as all other Christians. 
But in order to be an elder, he cannot be a new convert. That would be obvious when we understand that, uh, that his responsibility is to, is to mold and to shape the very nature of the church. And so you could not be a new convert for you would not have that wisdom. There is also a responsibility over and above the responsibility of every Christian, and that is he must be married to a woman who is faithful to the Lord. And so the Bible uses three words to describe the wives of the elders, and then talks about his children, and they need to be believing children, evidently Christians. For the Bible says, if he cannot take care of the church, he can take care of his own family, how shall he take care of the church of God? Could I pause long enough at this point to commend those women who have served as elders' wives in this church and to commend those who are elders' wives even now. We have five elders and we have five elders' wives and there is no way that a man can be an elder unless his wife is dedicated and supportive of all that he does. And we are so blessed by having the elders' wives that we do and for the spirituality that they manifest in their lives. You cannot begin to imagine all that that she endures as she sees her husband. Perhaps when he comes home from an elders' meeting, she knows he's troubled, he knows something, but it's a matter of privacy. And so that he has to bear that burden alone because... There are things that need to be kept private inside the church and how blessed we are to have those wives in this church who understand that responsibility. There is that other aspect, and that is he needs to have Bible knowledge enough to stop those who speak contrary. False doctrines will arise. Acts chapter 20, Paul says, that grievous wolves will enter in among the flock, and you elders deal with that. And said, even from your own self, sometime inside the eldership, there will arise those who cause trouble. And elders need to have that kind of Bible knowledge so that by using the sword of the Spirit, they can stop the mouths of the gainsayers. Somebody says, that's a whole lot to try to remember. It really is. Can I tell you, young people, and those of you who are not so young, how I made good grades in school. If I had a list of six things to remember, like bishops and presbyters, go ahead to the next slide, bishops and pres- or elders and presbyters and bishops and overseers and shepherds and pastors, how on earth will I remember this list of six? Well, I'd take the first letter. The, the B, the E, and the P, and the B, and the O, and the shepherds, and the pastors, and make a new word out of it. Elders, because they must have children, must be pops. Bishops for B, E for elders, presbyters for P, uh, uh, O for overseers, P for pastors, and S for shepherds. That will be on the final test to get into heaven. So I would encourage you to understand. No, it will seriously. It will help you when you study the Bible to recognize when you run across these words. All you're doing is talking about those things that are involved. Could we spend some minutes to talk about the responsibilities that elders have and the joys that they have of being elders? Sometimes it's a thankless job. Sometimes it's a situation where, where they're bearing burdens that, they were not, that they'd never have to bear if they were not elders. So we want to talk about the joy that sometimes, sometimes motivates them. Well, their responsibility is to take care of the bride of Jesus. He's coming someday for His bride, the bride being the church. And so God says to these elders, You are responsible. Jesus says, you take care of my bride. Here's a young man that may be going overseas. He's he's newly married, and he says to his best friend, while I am gone, make sure that my wife is taken care of. Jesus is gone, not overseas, but has has returned back to heaven, 
to come back someday and to claim his bride. And he says to elders, you watch out for my bride so that she will be characterized by purity and fidelity and devotion to me. Elders have that responsibility. They're responsible for every member of the church. We'll see, read a couple of verses in a minute from Hebrews. But elders need to understand they're not just responsible for those that are closest to them. They are responsible for every member of the church. What an what a enormous task that is that those five men who are elders in this church have. One of the reasons we fill out these attendance cards every time we come together is because an increase of attendance more than before indicates greater fidelity and greater interest in your life. And a decrease indicates oftentimes a weakening of your devotion to God. And that's one reason we always fill out cards every time that we're assembled. You may not be aware that in almost every elders meeting time is spent talking about those who are wayward. How can we help this individual? And calling some of you by name. How can we help this individual grow and to be what God wants him to be? Because they have responsibility. And the verse in Hebrews says, they will give an account to the Lord for all of those sheep in his flock. He's the chief shepherd, but he's given to you, those who are elders, a responsibility to watch out and be aware. Could I share with you something that I ask our elders to, pre to prepare for me? And that is the joys of being an elder. Why on earth would a man accept the responsibility as grave as it is? Why on earth would he spend the hours that he spends in, in uh, serving the Lord in this respect? And the answer is because over against that is that affirmation that says, When the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall be rewarded. I ask the elders, each of them, to write down two joys that they had, and I'll not read all of the joys. It's a joy to be an elder at Palm Beach Lakes, to have the many hours of close association with fellow elders and the evangelists who have devoted their lives to preaching the gospel and who love the Lord and His church and His, His words. It's a joy to be an elder at Palm Beach Lakes and be involved in the lives of members and know the good that they do for each other and for the congregation. It's a joy to be an elder and seeing the love and commitment demonstrated by the giving of this congregation for special projects and needs, such as given for Robert Martin and Scott Shanahan recently. It's a joy to be an elder when we see the restoration of a Christian after intense hard labor to bring it about. It's a joy to be an elder at Palm Beach Lakes because of the men who have become preachers, because of the efforts of Palm Beach Lakes. It's a joy to be an elder, because I'm serving the greatest people on earth. It's a joy to be an elder, to be involved in soul saving, not only my own, but others. It's a joy to be an elder at a church that seeks Bible solutions for problems in peace and harmony and supporting and uplifting each other. You and I need to have an appreciation of the fact that the future of this church depends on there being those individuals who are willing to become elders and to develop themselves and to do all that they can to train themselves to be elders someday in the church. What's our responsibility in our relationship? The Bible says that in reference to them having spiritual maturity, the concept elders and presbyters, that we need to recognize that maturity and imitate their faith. Psalms chapter 1 verse 1 says, 
Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Flipping that to the positive, blessed is the man who walks in the counsel of godly. You and I need to understand that because there are those godly men among us, we can go to them and receive wise counsel about our lives. They're our shepherds. Sometimes as a sheep wanders about, sometimes even wanders away, doesn't know what he ought to do, we have an obligation to respect the spiritual maturity. And Hebrews chapter 13 says, Obey them that have the rule over you. And you and I need to understand that. Hebrews chapter 13 says, Look at their lives and imitate their faith. Such a grave responsibility. In reference to their authority, bishops and overseers, we need to understand that the church is not a democracy where everything is put up for popular vote. That's not the very design of the church. God wanted the church to be spiritual, and so instead of putting the mayors and the rich people and those influential in society in the forefront of the church, the church being spiritual, He put men who were spiritual to lead the church. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over, the, over, over you and submit yourself to them. And finally, we have a responsibility given from God to give honor to elders. In a passage written to young Timothy, Paul talks about the role that, that uh, Timothy had as the evangelist in the church there in Ephesus. And he says, Timothy, you give honor to elders, double honor to those who labor in word and in doctrine. There are those elders that deserve double praise, as it were. The word honor in and of itself talks about respect. And so Paul says to Timothy, and by that, by implication, says to all of us, give honor to those who are elders. And that's what we're trying to do in this very lesson, to honor them and to honor their wives for all that they've done. And perhaps we should add into that to honor their children, who because they, they, are fa they were faithful Christians, allowed their father to occupy the highest office on earth, and that is an elder being an elder in the church. We have an obligation to become fellow laborers with them, for they are servants, and you and I need to learn how to be servants by looking at them. The church is a kingdom, but they're not lords. They are citizens in that kingdom who by the grace and the mercy of God have found a place to serve God and more especially to serve the church by, by being a part of that kingdom, citizens of that kingdom. The church is an army, but they're not generals. They're foot soldiers. They are a part of every battle that is, that is involved and they do not sit back and, and, uh, and tell, ever, tell everybody else, you need to be going out and doing this. They are fellow soldiers in the kingdom of God. And the church is a body. You and I need to understand that as a body, every part of the body has its place. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about those parts of the body that have, that have greater honor, and we bestow greater honor on them. But it talks about the lesser parts. And all that says is that every part of the body, none is more important than the rest. But there are those that are more visible than the rest. And we ought to be thankful that in this church we have those individuals who serve the Lord as elders and serve Him so well. There are two or three other things I want to say after the invitation song. But before we do that, it may be that you've thought about becoming a Christian and you need to do that today. Do you believe in Jesus? John chapter 3 and verse 16 says you must. 
Will you change your mind? Will you repent of your sins? Luke chapter 13, verse 3 says, if you don't do that, you'll perish. Would you confess the faith that's in your heart in Jesus Christ? Romans chapter 10, verse 9, and this very day, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, be baptized into the body, into the family. You see how wonderful it is that we're now part of that army. We're now part of that body. We now are now the bride of Christ. If you haven't done that, the invitation song is the time for you to come and say, that's what I want to do. If you're an unfaithful Christian and you've wandered away, we ask you to come back in every way that we can. Let us know how this church can help you as together we stand and sing. Will you come? Everybody except six people in this congregation this morning know what's about to happen. And uh, I know that I'm in trouble with my elders because they don't like attention called to them. But we have some elders who have served this congregation for so many years. And we want to honor them today because a part of the work of an evangelist and a church is to give honor unto those. And so I'm going to ask at this time, Joe, if you and Marion would come, Johnny, if you and Betty, and Jerry, if you and Shirley would come and sit on this on the front pew. Yes. Johnny, we need you up here. Good luck. <laughs> Johnny, if you and Betty will sit over here. This is a well-packed pew to comes all the way back over here. We owe you guys a debt. And while you never have liked personal attention called to you, we have responsibilities as a church to say thank you. Think of how many times Paul publicly in his letters writing to the church would say, I thank God for every remembrance of you, I thank God for them. And you and I need to understand that we thank God for you. And so this congregation, not out of the treasury, wants to honor those who are elders this day for such a long time. In honor and appreciation of Johnny Davis, for serving us and leading us and shepherding us in the paths of righteousness for almost four decades. This token of love is presented, love and appreciation is presented to both you and Betty. We thank God for all that you have done to help each of us to become more like Jesus and making this church all that it is. With eternal gratitude, the Palm Beach Lakes Church of Christ. Johnny and Betty, we love you so much and thank you so much. In addition to that, this church has written an abundance of letters so that you'll have a memory of how much you are loved and appreciated by this church. Thank you, Johnny. in honor and appreciation of Joe Holland for serving us and leading us and shepherding us in the paths of righteousness for almost four decades. This token of love and appreciation is presented to both you and Marion. We thank God for all that you've done to help each of us to become more like Jesus and making this church all that it is. With eternal gratitude, the Palm Beach Lakes Church of Christ. 
Thank you, Joe, so much for all that you've done. We love and appreciate all, the, all that you are. In honor and appreciation of Jerry Hopkins for serving us and leading us and shepherding us in the paths of righteousness for almost four decades. This token of love and appreciation is presented to both you and Shirley. We thank God for all that you've done to help each of us become more like Jesus and making this church all that it is. With eternal gratitude, the Palm Beach Lakes Church of Christ. And as Johnny and as Joe have received, so Jerry, you receive this booklet that has messages of love and appreciation from our, uh, from our hearts to yours, the Palm Beach Lakes Church of Christ. Now we know that this could never happen if the wife were not involved in it. And as we tried to plan this day, we thought about sending you away somewhere <laughs> and <laughs> decided against it. But we appreciate the fact that you have served so well. And how can we honor Betty, you, and, and Marion, and Shirley, how can we honor you? We thought about giving you a card to go to a restaurant somewhere. But... Uh, that didn't seem what was right. And so this, members of this congregation are going to give you wives a visa card and you can, you can or cannot share it with your husband. <laughs> <laughs> but we appreciate so much, Betty, for what you have done. And Marion and Shirley for all that you've done. A visa card is worth five hundred dollars. <laughs> There's no way that my heart can express the hearts of this congregation. I've been here thirty-five years, and in, in that time, I've served under several who are elders. And what a joy it's been, and how thankful I am for all that all that you have been and all that we hope you'll continue to be in causing us to be the church of Jesus Christ in this area. Now we have two other, other elders and they have served as long and they may be worthy of honor and someday when you guys have served 40 years we'll try to honor you. <laughs> but Phil, we want to ask you and Mary and Dan and Lonnie if you guys will come right now to the front. One thing that we have done before is to surround people that we love, like Josh when he was going to Paraguay and others, and singing with them together. And that's exactly what we want to do. In a few minutes, just as soon as, I, as soon as we can get the, the, all of this organized, we're going to have the elders and their wives to come and stand in this area. We'd like to have everyone to come and come and leave the aisle open and come this way. Those of you in that area may want to come in behind. And the same thing about you, those in, in this area. We're going to surround you with the love that we have for you. And then we want to sing, Blessed Be the Tie. And elders, as we sing that song, if you guys will, and with your wives, will just walk on out and go out into the foyer. We want you to be our greeters today because we all want to express to you our gratitude so very much. So if the elders and their wives can come and stand in this area and everybody stand and, uh, uh, and, and come to walk this way to, as far as you can, uh, toward this center aisle, and perhaps you want to come in behind them, but if elders, if you and your wives will come and, and uh, stand in this, Joe and Marion and Dan and Lonnie, Phil and Mary, Joe and Betty and Jerry and Shirley, we love you guys to stop about right here.
Stop right here. Stop right here, okay. Let's all quit. We can. We're going to sing one song and then we'll have a closing prayer.